Welcome to the Plant Free MD Podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is just eat meat and that's what you should do. But if uh, you're hiking or road tripping or stuck at work and you want something nutritious that is just meat and fat and possibly salt if you want it, the carnivore bar is a great option. I like this product not only because it is pure meat, but also because I really want the carnivore market to thrive as well. The more we support meat only products, the more people will make meat only products and this will bring this into the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to check out, then Take a look and use my discount code HTC to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks, guys. Hey, everybody. Back with another episode of the How To Carnival podcast. Uh, we've got Anthony Chafee here, the Plant Free MD, and also John Jaquish, Dr. John Jaquish, um, who has a PhD and is the inventor of Osteo Strong and the X3 Bar. Uh, so it's time to talk working out, carnivore, getting jacked as you get older. Um, and all those good things. So, uh, welcome Anthony and welcome John. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you, man. It was, uh, you know, it's been a while since we, we spoke last time, but, um, I definitely wanted to, to talk to you more about, uh, you know, just the X3 war and just exercise fitness in general. Um, last time we, we spoke, a lot of people got, got quite a lot out of that. And, uh, a lot of people have been asking for an encore. So I appreciate you be making some time to come back on. 100%. And we'll do it a third time if people still have more questions. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so far away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right, well, let, let's get into it, talking about the X3 bar. So uh, Anthony's been using it for a little while now and is doing a, doing the 30-day challenge. Um, John, how did this how did this come about and, and what's the purpose of the, of the X3 bar versus, you know, just going to the gym? So I had been going to the gym for 20 years, uh, and I really didn't get much out of it. Um, I you, had you, read you didn't get much lot. out of it, so you, you weren't in good shape? Or? Um, I mean, I was lean for a little while, but that had less to do with the gym and more to do with my diet. And uh, I played rugby in, in uh, university, so that keeps you lean. Yeah. Like sprinting and stopping, sprinting and stopping. Like, you don't see a lot of fat rugby players. So, um, I was, how do I, how do I say it without totally trashing weightlifting? I mean, I guess <laughs> I was sore on a regular basis. I really didn't gain a lot of muscle. Um, when I was playing for a semi-pro team, um, I had some testicular damage. Uh, so then I got a prescription for testosterone replacement therapy. And so this was at 27 years old. And so, and then I was like, ah, I don't really need rugby in my life anymore. I'm a much better fan anyway. Like, um, you know, like, like I'm pretty sure, like, Anthony, you went like all American, right? Yeah. 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 Not me. Yeah. I was just, I was, I was there for like my, my university experience was much more about, uh, well, it was, I guess it was about academics. I, I, I did pretty well. And then, um, I like my fraternity and rugby was just something that was like, yeah, like yeah. I'm tough. I can do this, but I wasn't, I wasn't planning on like a future in rugby. So like ever last, last talk we had, Anthony was going on and on about all the stuff he did in rugby. And I'm like, I'm identifying with like the first story and then the second story. <laughs> and, and, then, and, and, then and then I'm, and then I'm for America. It's like, bro, like, I'm uh, you lost me so um yeah yeah so uh it, well, it was certainly a fun experience and I love the game but uh you know I was way more interested in keeping my teeth and my face intact than I was winning games and at a low level you'll do fine in rugby uh with that attitude at a high level you'll do awful <laughs> because the other guys you know and also <laughs> Coincidentally, after I graduated, I, I did some research on different bone uh, density and bone structure of different races of people. Who's best at rugby? So like New Zealanders, Islanders, the gauge of bone. Like if I, if I grab onto my radius bone right here, 
Hmm. You know, just pinch it. You know, it's maybe two centimeters thick. You'd find a guy that was smaller than me on the field, shorter than me. He would have thinner bones, you'd think. But if he was from Tonga or Samoa, it was like the dude had rebar in his arms. <laughs> it was like, mm. like you know, you grab on his wrist and I'd be like, let me see that for a second. And I remember thinking, I'm writing a paper about this. And I did. I did. It was, yeah. it, it was an interesting, like different races of people are just designed for high impact collisions. Mm -hmm. And others are not. So, uh, and, uh, you know, like white dudes really not, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but if you got some Islander in you, then, you know, you're good. So, uh, so that was, that was part of my, part of my reason. But then when I got out of school and, and to answer your question, uh, my mother was diagnosed with osteoporosis. And so I, and this is where OsteoStrong came from. <clears throat> I looked at how I could treat her bone loss uh, she didn't want to take any of the drugs that were out there and I didn't blame her. I read some of the side effects and I was like, God, like the side effects are worse than having osteoporosis, mm. which we see all the time, the different side effects of medications. Um, and, and also as I got into research, I met a lot of researchers that told me, you know, there's no such thing as a side effect. Drugs have effects. Some you want and some you don't. Yeah. And it's like, just understand that and you will do so much better in writing about pharmaceuticals versus physical medicine. Cause like I could see where like I was trying to go. I was trying to say, what if we could come up with a physical medicine solution? Uh, something where we could make the human body do something and we could create an environment where the bone density had to go up instead of down. So sedentary lifestyle, bone density is going down. How do we get enough force through the bone so that we trigger it to grow and not just maintain, like grow, like go back to where it was when you were 30 years old, which is when peak bone mass is. So <clears throat> I built a series of devices uh, that are now found in osteostrong locations and they put compressive force on bone to emulate high impact forces. So not high impact, but the emulation of high impact to manifest those growth uh, differences, you know, that we see in younger years of life. So I did that. And then just through some of my connections, the first uh, real clinical trial was at um, the University of East London. And uh, they were using a, a nearby hospital facility to do patient recruitment and do the therapy act. And um, so as they were doing this, some of the physicians at the hospital who had osteopenia, which is like pre-osteoporosis and osteoporosis, were like, well, we can't be test subjects because we're not blinded, but we want, just want to use the device. Like, is there any reason we shouldn't? I'm, no, no, go ahead. It's very safe. And so they used it and they noticed, they took DEXA scans and they showed bone growth. And uh, they were thrilled because this was a problem that was bothering them and they didn't want to take the medications either. You know, I, I find it interesting when I talk to a lot of physicians about prescribing certain medications. And then I ask, well, would you take this? Different answer. Yeah. Like they'll prescribe something frequently. And it's like, would you take this? Well, you know, I might look into nutritional solutions first. It's like, well, what, you don't say that to your yeah. patients. Though. And I get the same argument every time. Yeah. Compliance. I tell yeah. patients to work out, they don't. I tell them to stop eating Twinkies, they don't. I tell them to stop drinking two bottles of wine a day and they don't. So it's tough. Okay, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll give them that. You know, like a pill, like, unless the pill gives them like immediate acid <laughs> reflux or something awful happens right away, yeah, they might stick with that. So wh like, why is it always a medication? Well, that's part of the reason. So, so, uh, they used this device and they got a results that they never expected to get even from some stronger courses of drugs that they would never take. And so they were thrilled. And uh, when that clinical trial was coming to conclusion and uh, I wasn't writing it up, I was just there to make sure they were using the device correctly, you know, because you want to make sure they don't use it wrong and then get a bad result. And then it's like the data is worthless. Yeah. <clears throat> so say it again. No, I was just, yeah, I was agreeing with you. That's, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. To make sure they're, they're actually have the proper technique. So some of the physicians were saying, I can't believe the forces that are going through my body. It's like six, seven, eight, nine times my body weight. 
Um, and I remember the, the, the one who had the highest loading compared to her body weight, she was a 90 pound woman. And she was putting nine times her body weight through her hip joint. And she's like, that's like, I looked up like strongest people in the world can't lift that. And I'm like, well, okay, you're not lifting it. You're compressing your bone mass specifically in the hip joint to mm. get that loading. But it's a very interesting point because in weightlifting, like if like really once you look at that research and then compare it to regular weightlifting, and I did that, I did a comparison of the NAINS database and what people on average lift. And for those that don't know what the NAINS database is, it's the largest health database in the world. They add about 2000 people per year and have been doing so for maybe 12 years now. And it's whole battery of tests. There's strength testing, there's uh, body composition testing, there's uh, blood work, like mm. pretty much every conveniently gathered and some inconveniently gathered health metrics are all put together on different individuals. And with that much data, you can look at certain people and draw some conclusions. Mm. Maybe. Is it, or and it's like a, and it's like a problem. random sample of people? A random yeah. sample of population. Yeah, wow. Right. But then what you get the random sample, then you can parse it out to like marginally athletic people, highly athletic people. And then you start to understand maybe athletic populations. It turns out like some of the most athletic people that are in the innings database work out two or three times a week. Right, okay. Not, Not every day. Shocked. Like, really? Like I would expect people to be working out a little more than that. But we do live, well, I live in the United States. And 75% uh, of men in the United States are overweight or obese. So you got to consider what the norm is. Like, what's the average? If the average is, for, you know, overweight or obese, well, you know, then the fit people in the NAINS database may not be so fit. But for these, for the, the purposes of what I was looking into, it was like, what sort of weights are people dealing with when exercising the lower extremities, versus how we compress the hip joint in in the osteostrong medical devices so looking at the capacity by the way in osteostrong all the force is self-created so force doesn't come on you you create the force and you're looking at a computer readout of what your body's capable of so think about it this is for safety reasons like can i break my own finger by squeezing a fist no can't do it no you can't because yeah. neural inhibition. It's sort of like it takes more force to bite through a carrot than it does through your own finger, but you can't mm. bite through your finger. Mm. Your own neural inhibitory process will stop you from doing that. Like it just won't let your jaw muscle contract enough to yeah. actually, you know, cause you to go right through, right through a bone. <clears throat> so um, looking at that whole solution, I realized people are seven times stronger in a stronger range of motion like right here than they are in their weaker range of motion so now knowing that i thought wow like weightlifting is a terrible approach to stimulating muscular growth because we are so powerful yet we don't know it because every time you go to lift weights you pick the weight you can handle in the weakest range of motion but you're actually seven times more capable. See, what you need is a weight that's changing as you're moving it from strong to weaker range. And it's got to be relevant in every range. So then I thought, okay, I'll write a book about band training because that seems to have never taken off. And keep in mm. mind, this was probably like seven or eight years ago, um, way before I launched X3. And so I bought a couple of the heavier bands I could find because most of the bands out there are like five pounds. You know, like mm -hmm. It's not relevant for strength. Great for rehab, not relevant for strength. So I found some 50, 100 pound bands and immediately it was like every joint in my body hurt because you can't, when you grab a hold of a band, it wants to be a circle. Well, the human body doesn't interface with circles so well. We mm -hmm. interface with flat ground and straight bars real well. And that's been known, and that's why that's what fitness is based on. But at the same time, you need those, those services and those grips to be able to fully engage the body. So I thought, okay, it'll, I got to develop. Now I got to develop a product. Now it's not about writing a book. 
uh, though I did write the book anyway. Uh, and then, and so it was like, we need something to keep the wrist neutral and the ankles neutral. And if we do that, we can load the body far beyond what weightlifting can ever do in the appropriate range of motion and trigger growth much faster. And that's, that was the birth of X3. And I did write the book, weightlifting is a waste of time. It's a Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> um, Great people are title. very upset about the title. Yeah. Uh, most people who complain about the title never read the book. Shocking. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's the, the, we don't really like the company doesn't target people in the fitness industry per se. We're much more interested in um, sort of the busy professional mm. who can maybe read some science and understand it, but fitness people cannot understand science. <laughs> not, it's not that they don't won't try. They are not capable. They're not <laughs> like just, I mean, look, the, the two biggest fitness information outlets on the internet are YouTube and Instagram. Videos and pictures. Yeah. I, I mean, it's like we're in preschool. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you got to turn the whole book into a video of um, of short Instagram reels. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And they can just flick past the parts they think they understand, but don't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, I, I don't know what the actual answer is. It's okay because I'm getting to the market that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. But like... <clears throat> Yeah, I'm just absolutely blown away. <laughs> like yeah. when, I, when I bump into these fitness people, like, you know, all kinds of swear words, which usually would hit a filter, but they misspell even the swear words. <laughs> so they get through. <laughs> yeah, they can't even get their profanity right. Yeah. So, you know. So, uh, so John, who's it, who's it really working for? Is it um, like older people who have osteoporosis or, you know, busy professionals? Well, osteo strong, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, for X3... The, uh, it, it's, it's really just the busy professional. It's the guy who tried lifting weights, didn't get anything out of it, which by the way is like 99.9% .9 of the population. Like how many people do you two know? I already answer, uh, you know, got this answer from Anthony, but you know, could you create a list of 10 people that you know that have been working out for more than two years who look absolutely no different whatsoever from the day they started? Yeah, you could. Everybody. Yeah, could. very common. Because that's almost everyone who is involved in fitness, you, you, nothing changes. If you're fat, you're still fat. If you're skinny, you're still skinny. Yeah. yeah. It just, it's not working. And, uh, I got some explanations for that. The biggest genetic difference is tendon layout. So like, if I look at my, my tendon, you know, like, like my pectoral, so the origin is here and then it attaches right, you know, here, you know, that's where it's supposed to attach right here, sort of uh, comes underneath the bicep and attaches on the humerus. So its job is to draw the humerus in towards the midline of my body. But some people, maybe one tenth of 1% have it over here or anywhere else along that, that humerus bone. Well, the further away from the origin you have it, and there's maybe six or seven different studies on this, further away you have it, the longer lever you have in your body. So if you have a lever in your body, you have a massive advantage. Mm -hmm. And this is why most people lift weights and get nothing out of it. And then all of a sudden there's one guy who seems to grow bigger every time the guy shows up at the gym. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to high school with a guy like that. His name was Mark. It was like, we started working out at the same time. We were about the same size. The guy put on like 40 pounds in a summer. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think I yeah. put on one. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know people who've done that. I'm got a feeling. Yeah, yeah. I've done and that I'm just well. looking at him like, what are you doing? And he goes, I don't know. The only difference uh, between what you're doing and what I'm doing is I smoke cigarettes. And I'm like, yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be yeah. a cigarette. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the guy just, he just couldn't stop growing incredible musculature. Yeah. Um, and he ended up being a, just an excellent athlete. But you know, that's, that's the genetic, genetic born NFL player kind of genetics. But when you train with variable resistance, you get that leverage. Like you're actually nullifying the advantage that most people have in getting the advantage your, or, or getting the advantage yourself, depending on how you want to look at it. But the lever arm makes no difference. And like really tall people, 
Like, look at the look at the NBA. A lot of those guys, like, they're in shape, they're lean, but they're pretty thin. Not a lot of guys can put on a lot of muscle. Uh, now they can. Because, no, it's, it's still harder to see on an NBA player when you're six it's, foot seven. Yeah, it's stretched out so much. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Like, a short guy puts on 20 pounds of muscle, and everybody's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, it's like a ball of muscle. Yeah, uh, an, an NBA player puts on 40 pounds of muscle, and nobody knows this. Yeah. 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 So, um, uh, but but still, they can they can grow some musculature because now their disadvantages are gone, and they can grow muscle like the NFL player now. Yeah. Um, can you, John. J- John? Can you dig into that a bit more? Because I'm because I'm taller and quite lean. So how? So because is it that they can get into that that um, kind of sweet spot of maximum tension and force faster with the X three bar, or, or why is it that that it's easier now for tall people to build muscle? It's the middle part okay. that you don't get stuck on. Uh-huh. It's the it's the this. It's the getting stuck right here. Right. Okay. Which we talk about that as like sticking point, but really it's just kind of a lack of leverage, um, lack of access to the muscle. Because you know when somebody helps you pass that point, you know you can you can do lockouts or something with some, yes. a weight that's much higher than you would otherwise be able to handle in full range. Mm. Mm. yeah because we've, we've probably all seen the the short muscular guy who can bench a heap you know they put 150 kilos on the bar and it's because they're only they're only moving the bar about this far that's right yeah. right and their mm-hmm. elbow is still closer yeah you know inside so they don't have the mechanical disadvantage that a taller guy would but with x3 none of that makes a difference no and it's, it also you um you see even in weightlifting trying to accommodate for that exact phenomenon you know they have like uh you know the heavy chains that put on the side of like a, mm-hmm. a bench bar so whereas like you know as you're going up it's pulling up more chains off the ground which would just add add weight too it's the exact same concept except it's it's, it's not adding nearly as much weight um as like the X, x3 bar can i mean it's adding sort of like five pounds per link but obviously there's uh, there's a limit on how many of those links right. you can on there. yeah if you're 11 feet tall maybe you can get some good variance in there yeah. but if you're not, <laughs> then probably not yeah that, that was sort of the other thing that when i looked at th- this is the advantage that i had that no one else who designed a piece of equipment ever had the advantage of having which was the bone density research so nobody really knew what the maximum capability of people were in their most optimized range of motion. It was always seen as a place where you absorb force. Mm -hmm. So you can absorb, like gymnasts absorb 10 times their body weight upon landing Mm. uh, from uh, the uneven bars. That's the biggest drop they have. So 10 times their body weight. You know anybody that squats 10 times their body weight? Oh, No, neither does anyone else. Yeah. So, (laughs) like way higher loading capability we have. Yeah. So how do we access that from an exercise science standpoint? Like how do we get the benefit of the landing that the gymnast has without having to actually become a gymnast? Because there's all sorts of reasons why we can't all go do that. So, I mean, if you're like over 5'8", you know, you, you can't do that, right? Mm-hmm. Anthony would never, if we put him on the uneven bars, he would just like whack his feet <laughs> out of the bar. Like, seriously, like you can't yeah. fit. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, how do we get that proper loading? And I, I realized that the ratio of force was really the critical issue because there have been some studies that showed variable resistance was great, but they'd be holding X at the bottom and maybe 1.2 X at the top where you really want X at the bottom and maybe four or five or six X here. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's gotta be in. Coincidentally, after I started, somebody came out with a study. I um, can't remember the author, but it's in the book. And uh, they showed that the greater the ratio of variance, the more muscular growth there is in a, in a shorter period of time. So, and, and X3 was like even a more aggressive ratio than they were using in that study. But I think that study might have been designed sort of around like, hey, this X3 idea, we're either going to prove it or disprove it. 
because that's how science works. You know, you don't, you don't start out trying to prove something works. You want to find that you want to create a test that'll show if it works or not and potentially why. Yeah. 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 Or potentially trying to disprove it. You know, that that's a, yeah. like a properly designed study is like, okay, you know, I, you know, let's, let's, we're, we're, this is our assertion that this works. Okay. Let's try and disprove it. You know, because it, you know, you're at a much stronger position there, you know, because you're looking for ways to, you know, you know, test it and look for chinks in the armor. And if you, like if you what, what nuances of the study would have, well, the previous studies would have made this work, even if it wasn't what it was. Mm -hmm. You know, so like, let's, let's eliminate even more variables that people didn't think of in the first trial. Yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, and with variable resistance, there's 16 well-written studies and 16 out of 16 show you grow muscle faster. And mm -hmm. I would say it, like, there was a study in the very beginning, one of the first ones I cited that showed that people were getting stronger at, at the triple the rate, which is why I called the thing X3. It's funny, like we tested that with a bunch of audiences and people just didn't believe it. And yeah. so I, I, I went to uh, the strap line of the product is now greater force, greater gains, which is somebody, nobody argues with. Um, and they grow muscle very fast still, but the idea that it was triple the speed, mm -hmm. Two things I didn't like about it. One is people found that so hard to believe, though it was true in the study. But also, I would say it's more than triple because most people who lift weights, they get zero. <laughs> you know, it's like, what's your progress after a year? Zero. Or what's your progress after two years? Zero. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's harsh to say. And I, I mean, I called the book Weightlifting is Waste, Waste Time for a reason. And uh, I call out all sorts of statistics about how unfit Americans are even the ones that go to the gym all the time because yeah. the people the people that you see at most gyms and the people that you see at the pizza hut are they any different no I mean well, maybe if you go to gold's gym in Venice California yeah that's different yeah yeah it's totally different though that's like yeah. you know like half the members there are professional athletes and um and also like, the people going to to pizza hut are often the same guys going to the gym because they you know they go they go to the gym and go I, I earned this pizza and they eat something wretched for their body and you know and they're just they're really really fighting against themselves so I earned this pizza. even putting in place pizza with heroin and say that same yeah yeah sentence like it's just i mean not that pizza is as damaging as heroin but mm. like stop justifying things to yourself yeah when you want something that you know is bad for you like just mm. play different scenarios like boy i had a really hard day so i should be allowed to cheat on my wife today yeah Ask her. <laughs> i don't think she will agree <laughs> so like it, it's like it's like one of these i've like, earned this how, <laughs> yeah how I've, earned these I've, I've been in the gym all day <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I played with the kids i bought my wife flowers i earned this hooker you know? <laughs> yeah right <laughs> Right. Like no one would say it. No, I mean, yeah. I'm sure there's some guy out there that probably has said that. Probably but, does think that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's like nobody would say that about anything other than food. Mm. And, and this is where we were talking earlier. And I, I was just about to say, like, for some reason, society, like if I, if I see somebody who smokes, and I see them just lighting, you know, their next cigarette with the burning butt of the last one. Yeah, I can say to that guy, like, you're, this is a bad path. Like, you like those too much. Like, get that out of your life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if I say it and not be a smart ass about it, even a random person will be like, mm, yeah, you're right. Maybe he'll listen. Maybe it won't be me. Maybe it'll be the next guy. Or maybe it'll be his uncle who dies of lung cancer. And then he goes, oh, fuck, I got to quit doing this. Mm -hmm. but try walking up to somebody and telling them they eat too much mm. yeah yeah like it's a random person it's not it not gonna you. go down well just, i mean just think think about the conversation i couldn't help but notice you're overweight um you should probably like make some better nutrition choices can i help you they yeah. will like lose I mean, their mind. yeah yeah they'll yeah. lose their mind yeah and, yeah. yeah that's just that's just the situation that we're in telling telling them you shouldn't be eating that 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, like I, I went to a Super Bowl party this year and uh, the food was all just junk food. Yeah. And so I went and I had a couple pounds of ground beef and then I went to the party and, you know, they noticed I wasn't eating anything. And I'm like, well, you're not serving anything that's food. <laughs> that stuff is edible. <laughs> Stripe I, I actually, in, in my own way, I thought that was like the nicest thing to say. <laughs> they, were like, yeah, they were like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I would never put any of this in my body. Yeah. Like, by the way, you shouldn't either. And just, I, like ruin, I like ruin this event. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm just gonna go, guys. I can just finish this game at home. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Nobody wanted me there at that point anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like um, you yeah, do talk about that as well. You know, people. Why is that such a problem? Yeah, yeah. It shouldn't be. No, but you, you should be able to say like we should hold ourselves to a higher standard and not yeah. like now I do like if I'm at a group dinner, especially if I'm paying the bill. Uh, you know, the people are like, oh, let's get the. You know, let's get the the cheese sticks and let's get the uh, you know the Bavarian pretzel balls. And I'm like, yeah, let's um, let's just <laughs> take not. the steak entree and you have the you know chef just cut it up and give us a bunch of toothpicks. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I do that all the time. And, yeah. Know, any restaurant will be like, yeah, sure, we'll do that. And yeah. uh, and then the people are like, why did you do that? That's not even that appetizer on the menu. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm the customer. I get whatever I want. Yeah, yeah. And also, we're gonna eat healthy. If you're gonna be with me, that's the yeah. price you pay. <laughs> yeah. Well, then, you know, a lot a lot of people do, um, you know, use use food in the same way that we use drugs. You know, and um, you know, people use, you know, people who do use drugs or they drink or smoke, or whatever. You know, maybe they'll yeah. they'll do that on the weekend. Maybe they'll drink on the weekend or do, you know. You know, a special event they'll go to parties or whatever um and they you know you they know that there's bad for them and they accept that it's bad for them and say well i know this is bad for me however i want this effect i want to party i want to have fun or whatever and i'll you know i'll take the hangover i'll take the the, the healthy i mean mm -hmm. they don't realize just how much it's hurting their body but you know they they at least recognize that concept and they're willing to make that trade-off but with food you know, they, they can also do that as well, but they don't, they don't realize it's as bad as it is. And it's like, oh, I'll have some pizza. Oh, it's not really the best for me, but, you know, I like it. And so we have that same sort of uh, relationship with food and even think about it in the same way. While, and, and then, you know, you tell a junkie. You're talking, I'm not going away. Yeah. You, you know, you, you tell a junkie, you know, it's just like, hey, you know, you, you should probably cut down. You know, a lot of them will get very offended as well. They'll get really pissed off because you're, you're, you're challenging Mm -hmm. you know their their habit and the thing is is that you know they, they probably know already that yeah that's you know, this is this is bad for them and now you're reminding them of this and you're like god damn yeah. i'm just trying to party all right i'm not trying to think about you know reality and, yeah. and you do that with food as well and people get get really pissed off um it's the socially acceptable addiction yeah absolutely be. yeah yeah and like every like, um like, you know, every, every birthday that comes around out comes the birthday cake and you know every uh, every sort of social get together out comes the cakes and coffees and sweets and all that sort of thing. It's you know very cultural, isn't it? And and in some cultures, it's better than others. Mm -hmm. um, my mother's from Belgium, and like, and I I don't like this about Belgium, but I also do. So. I mean, they're always talking about the chocolates that come at the end of the meal. And they're always talking about the little, little cute pastries. And I mean, like, this shit just pisses me off because I have 36 first cousins in Belgium. Oh, Jesus. Can you imagine how many pastries I get handed and I have to say no? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just like, come on, guys. You know what I do. You all follow me. <laughs> Stop it. But the good news is it's usually one piece of chocolate and one little pastry. Yeah. So there's something to be said about volume. Yeah. And that's not how Americans do it. Like no. if you get a piece of cake, you get like a huge piece of cake and you might have a second one. Mm -hmm. They don't do that. And then, yeah. and then, you know, in a lot of Asian countries, being overweight is considered shameful to your family. Like you're like gluttonous. Mm -hmm. So like, but they never talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, when somebody gets fat, it's like, mm -hmm. 
Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like the uh like the, yeah, it's uh, just like the old guys were like no yeah <laughs> Yeah, like the um, like the Asian uh, nail places where you know they, they have those like undercover uh, cameras and things like that. If someone comes yeah. in, oh, yeah. oh my god! And you see the <laughs> subtitles, and it's like, yeah, look exactly. at this lady, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They trash talk. Mm. Oh yeah, that in. I mean, I'm not saying bullying is positive, but I think it can be. Maybe a little, like a yeah. little bit of peer pressure. Can help us all. Um, well, I mean, there's, I mean, certainly bullying and, and really going after someone and, and being horrible is obviously, well, that's negative. yeah, yeah, it's, it's very negative. But like, but you know, the you know, in psychology, we look at you know, keeping people in, you know, in in the range of norms, and you know, when someone someone's stepping outside of that, you know, it actually is beneficial to the society for them to just go, hey, what the hell are you doing? You know, that's just that's not really what we do here, and you know, in social, um, uh, in, in what we know about health. Health. it's unhealthy. It's yeah. not, I mean, like, like, like what you see on the cover of Sports Illustrated now, they're like glorifying obesity. Like, mm. that's just the wrong move. Mm. Yeah. Like, if you choose to, you know, uh, if I had to put, you know, one over the other, like somebody who likes smoking marijuana. Okay. So you're going to get dumber. <laughs> you know, there's, there's quite a bit of research now. When you quit or when you take an extended break, a lot of brain activity comes back. But really the mechanism of THC is like limiting blood flow to the brain. Mm -hmm. That's why you uncontrollably laugh about stuff. It's like your brain isn't working. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, what is, I can't think of that name of that thing I need to eat. Oh yeah, fork, give me a fork. You know what yeah. I mean? That kind of thing. That's, that's hilarious. <laughs> but at the same time, it's because you, yeah. limited the blood flow to your brain yeah, yeah. Uh, so but if somebody has a habit of that the long-term effects aren't as damaging as if somebody's habit is i just like to eat a box of candy bars every day no and uh and you know that that's the kind of thing that we we, we need to be able to tell people no hmm yeah. yeah. It'd be nice to, you know, when this gets more, you know, mainstream, I think it is, you know, like, you know, people, because obviously, you know, everyone, everyone has a different opinion on what, what's healthy eating. And, and that, that's very hard for people. And, mm -hmm. and exactly. they say, it's just like, you know, like, what, what am I, who am I supposed to listen to? Everyone's making great arguments. I don't know what the hell uh, to believe. Um, but, you know, we obviously, you know, you know, the three of us are all, all making our arguments for, for a carnivore diet or a carnivore based diet. And, uh, you know, and, and it's starting to get some traction and people are now, you know, being mouthpieces themselves and, and start talking about this. Yeah, and they become healthier and then yeah. they go tell everybody, right? Yeah, that's it. And so, you know, eventually we're going to be able to get, get them being, you know, enough in the mainstream that they're able to, to sort of keep people into like that, you know, in that social uh, yeah. Constriction saying, "Hey, actually, that that's really not healthy. You should really put down that carrot. That's really that's really gonna screw you up, and um, and and actually have that make sense because, like, you know, it, it sort of sounds insane. Like, put down a carrot. You know, like, why would a carrot be bad for you? A carrot was what I needed. Yeah, exactly. And uh, that's all well, and then and then we got to untrain a lot of people who think that you know they eat carrots all day. That'd be the healthiest thing they could do. Mm. I love to." Eat all day no no you'd be like living on a toilet yeah <laughs> you'd probably you give yourself diverticulitis yeah um yeah. you know the standard of care for diverticulitis still i mean there's been 10 years of research that shows the higher your fiber the worse diverticulitis gets yeah yet the recommendation when you get diverticulitis is only fiber in your diet yeah like don't eat meat nothing just just fiber yeah. Well, and, 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 it makes it worse. and, and even, even more insane and, and counter to their own thinking is that, you know, when you go to the hospital with this stuff and you have to have rest tests, you go on a, you know, a low residue diet. So they, they even tell you like, like the general surgeons will say, Hey, you know, no fiber, nothing like that. As mm -hmm. soon as the infection is cleared, you know, they say, now you better get on that high fiber diet. You know, that, that's what's really going to protect you. It's like, are you insane? You know, like the, you, you literally, had to stop them from eating fiber 
because that was, you know, that was making this thing worse. And now stop. And you're telling them to do the exact thing that you right. told them was going to make it worse. Like that, that's just a level of insanity to me that, that just like, just beggars imagination because like you are countering yourself, you know, you see the evidence in front of you. You're saying, yeah, don't do that. Oh, but, but now you really need to do that. Like, what in the hell are you talking about? You know, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that in, in the hospitals, unfortunately. Every, day, every yeah. day in the hospital system. Also, what's in the cafeteria of, mm. actually, I'm kind of curious. What's in the cafeteria Awful. in Australian hospitals? Awful. <laughs> It's Thanks just, it's just carbs and sugar, carbs and sugar. Yeah. And that, it's just sugar. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Same thing with them. Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah, they got a little slice of apple cake or apple pie and they got a, oh, a couple of salad options and a couple of pieces of sliced fruit. And you're like, where's the barbecue? Yeah. Like, and like soda, and soda machines, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, they all have soda machines everywhere. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, and, and, and the patients, are getting, you know, just, just sugary carbs like that. That's it. You know, it's a, it's a lot of bread with jam, fruit cups, fruit juice. That, that is 95% of what these people get, mm. you know, and also, like fruit juice, like mm. that, that court case ended a long time ago. Fruit juice <laughs> is like right up there with like Coca-Cola. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and some of them, the hell some brings of them fruit juice. Yeah, and some of them even worse, you know. I mean, there's like there's certain fruit juices that have have more grams of sugar per you know per ounce than Coca-Cola. And it's just, oh, but it's good for you because it has vitamin C. I'm like, whoop de do. You know, you mix vitamin C in with your cocaine, you're like, is that, that this is good for you now? It's like, oh, I'm doing this for my health, you know. It's just like, no, you're not. You know, that's nonsense, you know, and uh, and, and giving this to people in the hospital, I, I that bothers me so much. And, um, you know, these people are, are sick, you know, and like, and, uh, I mean, we, we've known since the 1930s that, you know, carbohydrates fuel cancer and you know, the cancer cells taken 400 times the amount of glucose as our other cells, you know, from Otto Warburg, you know, you know Nobel prize winner in 1930. And yet we are feeding cancer patients the vast majority of their food. Yeah. Just sugar. Yeah. Yeah. What the hell yeah. are you doing? I often like, I mean, I did not take a single oncology class. I've read a lot of cancer papers. So I would say I have a working knowledge. Somebody comes to me and they're like, Hey, I've been diagnosed with it. I'm like, Hey, like not my field. Mm -hmm. However, I usually tell people when I hear somebody say cancer is always fueled by, by glucose. And so if you shut that down, like the cancer cells can't live. And so I hear that all the time from people who are just reading biohacking information or health books like, like yours or, you know, anybody's. Um, and I say, you know what, it certainly depends on the type of cancer. And I, I've not read enough to say that unilaterally about all different types of cancer it sure seems that that's the case, but I'd hate to be wrong on that subject. So I tell them, you know, you're, you're going to have to look elsewhere for a more definitive answer. Cause I just, I just don't want to touch it, but mm. it sounds like you've read a lot more about oncology than I have. Is, is that basically true? Like, like, yeah. I mean, I, I also know that certain types of cancer are hormonal sensitive, you know, breast cancer, for example, it's yeah. an estrogen sensitive uh so like the sugar is not the whole story but could it be it's a, it's a major major part and you know even though if, if things is are it the biggest sensitive, part i think so yeah absolutely because it's it, you know it's you, you can have you can have different sensitivity you know, sure you can have an estrogen uh sensitive tumor uh and maybe estrogen will will stimulate it to grow right but it, a hormone is not fuel exactly cause a cell to like divide yeah. it, it's just it's just giving you a signal and but if you don't have the fuel to grow you're not going to grow and so you know you can have you can have the estrogen but if if you're limiting the glucose and you're limiting the fuel supply it's not going to be able to grow and um and so that that's a major major bottleneck you know and so and and all all, all the ones that i know of um i haven't heard of any that don't follow that 
that glucose. I pattern. haven't found that either. And yeah. I have looked, I have looked yeah. for some, you know, maybe there's a type of cancer that just likes fats or just likes proteins or, or yeah. what no. they're all glucose fueled. Some, some like glutamine as well, but, but not all of them. I, from my understanding, all of them, you know, need this massive amounts of glucose, you know, because they're, they're, <clears throat> they go into a ferment, fermentative state. They're not going through oxidative phosphorylation. So now they're having to ferment and it, that requires massive amounts of glucose because it's not as efficient. You know, you're not getting, you know, the 36 ATP, you know, you're getting like two, you know, and so you just need tons and tons and tons of this stuff. And so uh, it's very, very I mean, uh, glucose dependent. You know, Steve Jobs had pancreatic cancer. Yeah. And, his, and you know how he treated it? He self-treated it. Fruit, right? He became a fruitarian. Oh my God. All he ate was fruit. Yeah. And I don't know who gave him that advice, but like, as soon as I heard that, it was like, that yeah. seems like the worst thing you could do. Absolutely. And like, I don't know. Well, it's not, it's not giving his body the nutrition that it needs to, to function and, and uh, fight this thing off properly. And you're, 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 you're giving the cancer jet fuel, you know, I, I definitely, uh, would not <laughs> recommend that to people, but, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, you know, he, you know, as, as an intelligent and, um, you know, accomplished man as Steve Jobs was, you know, he, he's still caught into this, you know, like people are like, what, what the hell do I eat? What's, but, and he, and he was, right. he looked at this Overwhelmed and, and with that information. He had no idea how to That's make it. an informed decision because he had all, he had, yeah. he had bad information. You can't yeah. make a good decision with bad information. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that's part of the, you know, that's some of the things that, you know, like Thomas Sowell talks about when we're writing about uh, intellectuals and, and things like that, they can be brilliant in their field and, and the, you know, one of the most highly regarded experts in their field, but then they go outside of their field and they still have that mentality of I'm, 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 I know everything and I'm so great at everything. And then, and then they look at a little bit of information and they go, you know, completely down the wrong path but they have that confidence because they're normally right. And they're normally the authority forgetting that how many decades it took them to become an authority in their field. And if anyone else stepped into their field, just, you know, shooting off at the hip, they, they would shut them down and be like, you don't know what you're talking about. And then they go into other fields and do the same thing. And, um, and unfortunately they can get burned by that. I'm not saying that, you know, Steve Jobs is going around, you know, saying that he's an expert or anything like that, but you can, you can end up looking at something and hearing yeah, something that about a month before, and then, about a month before he died he said i i don't know how to treat pancreatic cancer but mm -hmm. i know what i did was the wrong thing okay oh, right. well, okay yeah well that would, yeah because be he bad. just kept every time he went to the hospital like oh it's getting worse and worse and worse <clears throat> yeah yeah well at least he had, you know had some insight into that and at least hopefully you know other people hear that and and uh you know take that to heart yeah, it's really, it's really sad. You know, I, I don't know who convinced him that that was the right thing to do. Um, um, I, I believe he was he was into it earlier in his life. So when he got sick, he might have gone back to it because he was sort of a kind of like in the sort of rebellious hippie movement um, in his early sure. 20s. Uh, and then also very interested in technology and, and working uh, in Silicon Valley. So that was kind of his his setup. So yeah, when he got sick, perhaps he, he fell back on that way of eating, which is obviously disastrous for someone with cancer mm -hmm. yeah poor yeah poor guy hopefully hopefully that's not something that that, that um you know gets uh, any more people but you know you do see you know in, the, in sort of the, the vegan influencers and the fruitarians and things like that oh this is so good for cancer it's so good for this or whatever and people making these these really outrageous claims mm -hmm. and uh and you just you have to imagine you know that this is that people are taking this up and, and really hurting themselves. And that's, a, that's a big concern of mine. And, and one of the, you know, one of the reasons I sort of got into this was because, you know, people are, are really hurting themselves, you know, by eating the wrong thing. It's not, it's not a little thing, you know, it's not just like, oh, they're a bit overweight. You know, they're very sick, you know, and they're getting, they're getting illnesses that they shouldn't have to have. So and they, like, how about, how about the people that eat a primary carbohydrate diet and just white knuckle every day with their hunger mm -hmm. and they don't get fat. So they think they're healthy just because they're not obese. 
Yeah. But you're still a metabolic disaster. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and like I tell people at a fraternity brother say to me the other day, uh, geez, I'm, I'm diabetic. Mm. And he's a slim guy. He says, I don't get it. And I said, well, you eat sugar. Well, no, no, I don't. I mean, like at night I have like corn chips or, you know, like, yeah, yeah, that's sugar. Yeah. Um, like just because it's not sweet doesn't mean it's the right thing to eat. Like it's, it, and I, I have been arguing for a while that carbohydrates don't fit the definition of a macronutrient. Hmm. You don't need them. You don't. Yeah, you don't. Well, well, then they're not a macronutrient. Yeah. Because a macronutrient is something you need to survive. Yeah. If you don't need it, then it's not a macronutrient. Yeah. And hey, did you guys see uh, my interview with Menno Hanselmans? No, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I watched that just recently. That was the bodybuilder who talking about you don't need carbs to build muscle. Is that right? Right. Well, he's a scientist. He's been published all kinds of stuff. He has a great book called, uh, I think it's called The Mindset of Self-Control. Um so he did a systematic analysis of, I think it was 30 different studies on carbohydrates and performance. And there's a couple of like sentences in there and he repeated them on, on the, on the, I don't really have a podcast. I have a show, which I do like, I don't know. I say whenever I can, which I tell people is once a week, which is really more like once a month or never. Um, <laughs> you know, it, uh, I don't have unlimited time. So, but when something important comes up, it's like, I got to interview this guy and I got to get the video up. So I did a falsehood to fitness. That's what the show is called. Falsehood to fitness on carbohydrate recommendations. And like Menno said, you really, if you're athletic, you can absorb maybe 15 to 20 grams. Hmm. That's it. And anything else is unnecessary and will probably be stored as body fat. And like, that makes sense to me um, as a guy who has a tendency of being hypoglycemic. So I've never liked sugary stuff anyway, because of that, like I know when I started doing the hyperplasia protocol with the X3. So what that is, is you wanna precondition the muscles before the workout and during the workout so that the cells are more encouraged to split and become two cells. So this is the closest thing we get to permanent muscle growth. Uh, but you got to do a couple things. You got to volumize the muscle. You have to exhaust the muscle. And then you have to stretch the muscle to the point where you're in a significant amount of discomfort. Not pain, right before pain. Like as much discomfort as you could do before you're like, okay, this, this shit really hurts. So, um, I, I didn't write Sweet it spot. that way. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, it, it should be uncomfortable is what I said when you're, when you're stretching. And so what you do is you exercise and you take some, some glucose before the workout and drink a lot of water during the workout. So you're volumizing all the tissue. So you want, you want the tissue to be taking in the glucose and letting all the water in as well, because mm -hmm. you're better hydrated. And then as your so this is if you ever remember maybe in the 90s people talking about bag theory like the casing around the muscle the fascia around the muscles one of the limiters of growth mm -hmm. if you can stretch that muscle fascia out you'll allow for cell division mm -hmm. i've heard and some so stuff about I, this when i started doing that i was having like 140 grams of carbohydrates because there was a few papers that just said, you know, you want to do, you know, like your half your body weight plus 50 or some shit like that. I don't know. Uh, and and I, I don't remember it because it was stupid research and it was very irresponsible. And like every day I felt horrible. Like, you know, my hands were like this, like, like this is way too much. And so I just started cutting it down. I'm like, okay, this recommendation is just wrong. And, uh, and so when I revise the book, I'll be using Menno's uh, systematic analysis because it's really showing a very low level of carbohydrates to trigger that effect. And, but here's the craziest thing. Of all the things that were in there, and a lot of it was not a surprise to me because 
I find no performance benefit at all from higher carbohydrate day. I mean, I've run some experiments. I think people think they have like three Snickers bars and they go to the gym and they think, oh yeah, I'm going to just break all my records. No, you're going to do awful. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel awful. Um, it's not performance fuel at all. So here's the crazy thing to say. There is no dose response for carbohydrates and any performance increase with statistical significance. Nice. None. Zero. So you can have five grams, you can have 25 grams, you can have 50 grams. Mm -hmm. All of them do exactly the same thing. Jack shit. For yeah. your performance. <laughs> now, when it comes to growth and hyperplasia, that's a different story. But at the same time, why are we so interested in in a in something that's formerly a macronutrient that we're wondering what, what is it really there for? What's it really in nature for? And uh, not performance. Yeah. Zero performance <laughs> benefits. Mm -hmm. I know you guys are not shocked by this at all, but generally the fitness community and even a lot of like athletes, like I've talked to head coaches of football teams. I always tell their like former coach of the Chicago bears would always yell at his players, eat as much carbs as you can. Like that's your energy. Don't show up weak. Don't show up Don't weak. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a while ago. I mean, I talked to this guy maybe uh, 10 years ago. Mm. And like I had a lot of research that I had read and on my hard drive. And I'm like, oh, I've got to really want to correct this guy. But he's a head coach. I can't say shit. Mm. No. So, you know, just like, mm. I mean, you know, carbo loading is a massive thing. Like, you know, I remember growing up playing sport, you know, be past the night thing, before you play. But you never do better. No, I, I mean, I totally agree. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, yeah. it's a nothing thing. It's just, I think, I think also there's a, there's a tendency or a desire in the fitness community to overcomplicate things and for there to be some sort of hidden magic recipe, like you were talking about with the, mm -hmm. I don't know what glucose before you work out and yeah. go train and half your body weight plus 50, whatever, like people love that kind of like counting and intricacy and there must be some secret um, or something magic yeah. that we can do yeah, that's yeah, going to yeah. accelerate things. And that's yeah. why I'm not getting great results. It's like get healthy and train hard and train smart and do it every day and it'll yeah. work, right? Well, but, but also, I mean, they're getting told that, you know, training hard, you know, the, the smart way to train and the right way to eat is, you know, the wrong thing. You know, you're, you're sure. eating hard. I mean, that is the, the traditional sort of uh, taught knowledge that, you know, you need to carbo load, you need to build up your glycogen base and your, and your muscles in your liver. But, you know, as an athlete, I always felt better when I, A, skipped that nonsense, but B, just didn't even eat anything the night before or the day of. Uh, again, oh, yeah. always show up fasted. That's when yeah. you do better. Always, always felt better. You know, I was thought of it as like playing hungry. You know, it's just like, well, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I want to be hu hungry. You know, if I, I'm, I instinctually, I can need to go hunt. I need to go kill. I need to go back to primal roots. You know, if I'm hungry, you don't or my want blood flow like, going to your intestines when you're in the middle of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You want to go into your quads, to yeah. your traps, to you know, like it, you got to perform. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, what is the first thing a race car driver does when he takes his road car and puts it on the track? Shuts the AC off. Oh, yeah. Why? Yeah. He doesn't want energy going into that. He doesn't want that extra belt turning, wasting power going into his AC. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how... So let me just back say, how, how did you get into a carnivore diet yourself? Like how, how, how long have you been doing this and, and what sort of brought you over to that? Because obviously you I have, you can, have... I'm glad you asked that question. I think I have the coolest story. Yes. <laughs> because, I mean, hey, every, everyone came to it from somewhere. But um, so I developed X3 and I had always had, I, I mean, ketogenic nutrition. Like I read... Dan Duchesne's book, and uh, I forgot what that was called, but Dan Duchesne's, he only wrote one book, and I'll think of the name probably in the middle of the night, uh, but uh, I do that. But 
he, he wrote this book that was like the most impractical information for fitness you could ever imagine. A lot of it had to do with illegal drugs uh, or like, you know, like he was a really big fan of the caffeine, eph ephedrine and uh, aspirin combination, which, you know, causes cardiac arrest in some. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I mean, like you read, and he would say that in the book. It's like, oh, it does have a chance to increase chance of cardiac arrest. And I'm just like, damn. <laughs> That's like, a great idea. I, I probably, I, so I read this book right after high school and um, I, Simon, you, you said it like, like prob, I was probably at the age where I thought mm, maybe this guy's got like the secret information. Yeah. Because I think people do fall victim to that. And so I read this guy's book and it was like one terrible idea after another. Yeah. <laughs> like the last, like it was all, and it was all like, hyper dosages of like crazy shit and like he says my philosophy is use any drug you can get your hands on that'll increase performance like <laughs> that's like the thesis of this guy's book so they're making a documentary about this guy right now actually chris bell's making it that's uh, right. yeah, he's, he's, right. Right. he's a friend of mine um mm -hmm. great guy like it'll it'll be hilarious <laughs> uh, everything that guy does is, is really funny uh, bigger stronger faster was so funny um so like the last chapter of the book was ketogenic nutrition. And so I read that and I'm like, well, that's not crazy at all. I, mean, I don't even have to break a law to do that. I can just eat. <laughs> and so I had actually been on a ketogenic diet for a long time. Okay. And, uh, but you know, I still, it was like, I tested for ketones. Like you could get those strips you could pee on like years, 20 years ago. And so, uh, you know, I looked at the pH of my urine and, and, um, kept it pretty ketogenic but i i really other than that one chapter in that one book mm -hmm. and i didn't have i didn't have the scientific answers already so i i really came at it through like a, a very open-minded manner like i'm gonna recommend whatever nutrition because I, I didn't have a nutrition program i launched the x3 and people are like, what should we eat for the best results? This is like mm. week number one. Like I launched the product on the Dave Asprey podcast. And then the next week, people are, a whole bunch of people went out and bought it. And they're asking me, what's the best nutrition program? And I'm like, well, shit, I better film something. But before I film something, I better think about what I should say. Because I really don't know. So here's here's where I where I went. Like. If you look at nutrition research, you know, or, or talk to nutritionists, if you talk to 10 nutritionists, you'll get 12 different answers as to what you should be doing, you know, because so a lot of the same guys will tell you contradictory stuff. And it's like, but wait, that doesn't make sense. And they're like, yeah, it doesn't make sense to me either. But, you know, I say both of these things. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, amazing confidence I have in you guys. So uh, I, I, I decided to just backstep and say like, what are the greatest drivers of long life? Like in all, all cause mortality studies, is there anything that has been noticed of the people who live the longest? Now the blue zone thing is bullshit. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know what all blue zones have in common? Yeah. You got no birth certificates. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. There's a, there's, there's a study that says like all these blue zones like the only thing they have in common, it's like, there's no, you know, nutritional anything. There's no secret route. Wait, I, I, I'm not zone. familiar. What's, what's the blue zone? <clears throat> blue zone is where people live to be like well over a hundred years old, like yeah, 10, right. 20. Yeah. They're all lying <laughs> because, because the study says like the only thing that connects all these areas is they didn't have birth certificates a hundred years ago. Yeah. So nobody knows when anybody was born. Yeah. So they're just lying about it. Well, it, it, yeah, and, and there's other problems with the Blue Zone studies as well. That's something that, that people ask me as well. But like, it's it, the Blue Zone study was was like it's five zones, and they said, well, these people on average live longer than other areas and have more centenarians uh, than other areas. And and the conclusion was that this is because they have a very plant based diet. So the plants eating yeah. plants. Oh yeah. So what happened was somebody would say, "I turned 120 today." I said the agenda. Private aircraft from uh, Kraft Foods would land, 
and yeah. they'd have a dude with a briefcase of money. I mean, <laughs> I, I know, I don't, I don't know if this is Zach scenario. And a video down. camera. <laughs> it's, it's been pretty well shown that these guys ended up taking money from big food uh, lobbies or, <clears throat> or companies. And they would say like, oh yeah, I eat Triscuits every day and I'm, you know, yeah. 120. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like none of that's true. They never seen a Triscuit before, but they got a big check. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's that's really it's been a it's been a major point of vegan fraud. Um, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. but well, it's, it's and it's 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 more fraudulent than that too because uh, you know if you look at like Okinawa was, was one area, but like most of these areas except for like Loma Linda, um, yeah. which is a Seventh Day Adventist uh, group, and they you know religiously don't eat uh, meat. And you know I, I think we've all sort of spoken about the history of that and, and why that was. It was more to suppress people's uh um you know lustful feelings that was a sin and so they wanted to you know they wanted to people that ate meat actually were, were more you know virile and uh, and they were more uh you know wanted to procreate more so like oh that's bad we have to tamp that down somehow that's healthy no that's not healthy that's that's the opposite of that and um but uh, the other ones they actually you know like in okinawa they said oh they eat these yams are really mostly plant-based but if you actually look uh, they actually eat a lot of pork and they actually eat more uh, meat on average than the average mm -hmm. Japanese person, you know? Sure. So it's, it's like, so they, you know, they, they, their own results countered their conclusions and that, and you see that, you see that in a lot of studies, you know, that's why I tell people read the study. Don't just read the conclusion because, you know, a lot of the time, you know, the, the conclusion is not supported by their evidence or is completely contradicted by the evidence. I've seen that. I've seen that before as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, with Loma Linda, they were saying that these people were living on average seven years longer uh, than, you know, the rest of, you know, people in, you know, California and uh, America. And they're like, oh, this must be because they're vegetarian. And, um, but if you look at Mormon populations in, in the same area, they have the exact same uh, uh, longer life expectancy of, you know, seven years uh, on average. And, you know, they, they, eat whatever they want to eat, you know, and so they don't have any religious, uh, religious constrictions on their diet. Uh, well, what's a commonality there too. They don't smoke, they don't drink, you know, they're not going around, you know, uh, doing drugs and partying, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to live a, a, you know, a clean life. And so, you know, that's obviously a confounding factor, but they don't, they don't consider those. In fact, they, they paper over them in the blue zone study. So the blue zone studies, like, as you say, is just complete like, crap. And it's just, you, you cannot come to the conclusion that they did based on the information that they provided. So back to Simon answering your question, what I wanted to find was what are the greatest drivers of long life? And like I said, throw out the blue zone stuff because that was stupid. Um, <laughs> and it was conflicting. Like I wanted non-conflicting stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's only two things I found that are drivers of long life that are uncontested in research. And number one was high levels of strength and muscularity. Like some said mass, some said strength. Uh, and then the other one was low levels of body fat. Well, if you want to be as strong and as lean as possible, there's only one thing you should be eating. And that's animal protein. No. Like, yeah. just so to me, the nutrition story began and ended right there. I didn't need to read a single nutrition study to understand exactly what we should be eating. Because I just took a step backwards to where like, people aren't screwing with the data. Like Kraft Foods isn't, funding different groups to uh fraudulently say that crackers and cookies are really good for you <laughs> yeah we should, we should get these from the cookie tree you know yeah. that paleolithic area yeah. yeah yeah well that's cool so how, how long have you been doing this now for um about 95 percent strict carnivore for about four years nice mm. And, and um, it was probably like maybe 85% carnivore before that for about 10 years. Yeah. Nice. So I have no complications. I have no issues. I'm not low in any vitamins. Um, not a deficiency, nothing. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and John, what does it look like for you? Like, what, what, what do you eat? Do you love eating steaks? Do you eat two meals a day? How, how does everything work for you? Um, so I've, I've experimented with the one meal a day thing, two meals a day. 
uh, and then going extended fasting. I'm a big fan. Like, uh, yeah, you like the fasting. I've seen that. Yeah. Like you can drop body, especially dry fasting. Mm. Like if you try dry fasting, you'll never go back. So no water, literally no water, no water, no food for like multiple days. So I've done 72 hours. I've done that, uh, maybe eight times, 72 yeah. hours, no food, no water. That, that takes some, it takes some focus. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, like when you catch yourself daydreaming about a sip of water, <laughs> like, wow, like, how did I get here? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, but, um, there's great research. There's a German study and a Greek study that people went five days, no food, no water, no complications whatsoever. They urinated the same <clears> amount <throat> every day. I heard you say that in another podcast. That's, that's mm -hmm. unbelievable. How can that be possible? Like water. They're taking the water out of their fat cells, which is destroying their fat cells. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like you can't have, unless you're really morbidly obese person, you can't lose a pound of body fat a day. This is actually a commonly searched for thing. Can I lose a pound of body fat a day? Okay. Well, there's 3,000, well. <laughs> like cramming for an exam. Like, no. right, right. <laughs> Um, or, you know, somebody has, uh, you know, a wedding they're getting ready for and oh yeah, shit, I'm two weeks away and I've got 14 pounds to lose. So if I can just lose a pound a day. Right. And so like, <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that with calorie restriction, uh, because there's 3,500 calories in a pound of body fat. Mm -hmm. And most people are not big enough so they can have that much of a calorie deficit. Most people's basal metabolic rate plus activity is only 2,500. Okay. So you can never get there. However, in the dry fasting studies, <laughs> two of them, both of them went for five days. They lost more than a kilo per day. Wow. So, yeah, like, like two and a half pounds per day. Mm -hmm. Now, even in, in that state, even after rehydration, they actually lost more I was than a kilo per day. Yeah, but yeah, then it was the rehydration process. Your weight drops way down. Like I'll go three days and you know my body weight's down fourteen pounds, but yeah. then you know maybe maybe uh, uh, nine of it or eight of it come back quickly, but the rest of it, the body fat is just gone. Yeah, how does how does that affect um, musculature as well? Are you <clears throat> are you are you losing any muscle mass as well, or or, or you know dehydrating the, the muscles out? No. Mm -hmm. No, and I've confirmed that with DEXA scans. Yeah. Losing mm. Now, DEXA scans are ugly because you can take a DEXA scan, drink uh, 32 ounces of water, and it'll tell you you gained a pound of muscle. So <laughs> you got to keep that in mind. So when, when you do your baseline, you have to be absolutely dehydrated. Right. Okay. And then rehydrate, then do your dry fast. Right. And, and again, so... Yeah, that's how you can really tell. So, John, at, at at what point on a fast do you think you'd start to lose muscle, or how, how do you sort of see that working, Anthony? If well, to... if you're oh. truly fasting, I mean, there's there's people out there that are doing fasting mimicking, which is just bullshit. They're just a <laughs> low calorie diet. Um, yeah, I see these like <clears throat> fasting bars, and they're made out of like seeds and nuts. Fasting bars, seriously? Yeah, someone needs to be set on fire for that. Another gimmick. <laughs> Well, like, it's well. not fasting if you're eating whatever this is, which, by the way, like the ingredients are like chocolate, caramel, nuts, seeds. And Anthony talks about this a lot, but it, it just makes like, it, it makes you more hungry. Of course. You know? Yeah. <laughs> because glucose, you go back to glucose metabolism, you just go nuts. Like, oh my God, I need to eat something. So, um, true fasting keeps growth hormone really high. Now, growth hormone is not anabolic, but it is an anti catabolic. So you don't, if you're truly fasting, you don't lose muscle. Yeah. If you try and get away with like just having half a sandwich or something, then you're going to lose muscle. Mm. Because your body's trying to find a new homeostasis at that point. It's like, oh, we're, we're not able to get calories like we used to. So we got to adjust for this much lower number. So that's the cortisol response. And so you get rid of muscle and preserve body fat, which is why like, like bodybuilders who diet for shows, they are massively struggling against their own biochemistry, their own hormones. And, uh, you know, they lose 
so much muscle before a show. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, these people are impressive when they show up at their show, but they're way more impressive off season. And yeah. it's because the practice, the, the practice of a bodybuilder's dieting before a show with rare exception is really not scientifically what you should be doing. Now, I'm not a bodybuilder, never claim to be, don't really know much about it. Uh, would never advise somebody who came to me and said, hey, can you help me prepare for bodybuilding show? I, like, there's so much stuff I don't know about that, like pyramid of drugs that go along with that. I have, don't have a clue. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't advise somebody on that. But um, the way they diet down, like the massive calorie restriction, tiny meals, it's just misery and they're losing muscle and... Uh, torture torture um that was what um you know professor ben bickman uh from byu said when i, when I spoke to him you know, he said that you know as long as you're you, you you're not like cactic and and um you know emaciated and you're still producing ketones like you you actually can't lose muscle mass so you, your body is, is is you know getting that energy from the ketones that you're burning from your fat cells and until you run out of that you actually won't uh burn your your um your, your musculature so that that makes sense from what you're saying you know and um and it's funny you know, we, there are these studies talking about the fasting mimicking diets and this has you know similar effects to fasting as well so now that's funny that they're now marketing this as a, as a fasting mimicking bars and things like that you know that's mm -hmm. just um and it's a bit it's a bit absurd i mean all, all, all fasting mimicking diet is, is is a keto diet you know you're just you're supposed it's to be limited keto in in low calorie yeah yeah so it's like you know and, and so a fasting mimicking bar with with sugar and, and chocolate and stuff like that i'm sure yeah. that's not even doing that because well, it like, screws up ketosis like once yeah. you eat that i mean these bars aren't like 20 calories yeah <laughs> there's a study out there somewhere that like in a very obscure way mentions that if you have less than 50 calories that it actually won't break your fast, hmm. which from a homeostasis perspective, it makes sense. It's not like the body's going to be like, well, we got 50 calories. So that's just what we're getting today. That's normal. Like, yeah. no, it won't do that. Uh, so like there, there is some overarching logic that your body applies. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I was going to say too, um, so hopping on to the, to the X3 bar, um, I've been using this for a couple of weeks now and I've just decided you know, because I was, I was, you know, I bought it last year and, um, I was pretty sick of like the, you know, gyms getting shut down and all the different sorts of whatever. And I'm like, and I actually was looking at this when, when the gyms first shut down, it was like, okay, I need something in my house. Like normally when I was in Seattle, I had a, I had a gym set up in my house and then I was in Perth and it was like a year later and, uh, and everything was shut down. I was just, I was pissed i was livid because i had like everything set up exactly the way i wanted it there and i had no access and and so i actually looked into it at that time and um but uh i ended up you know just sort of trying it out last year um but just sort of just infrequently it, hasn't, it wasn't something that i was that i always did i certainly saw that you know it was a it was a difficult workout you could actually really push yourself and i really like that hardest workout of your life it is. And it's, yeah, it, you know, that's what Dr. Baker started saying. It's like, I've never had a heart. I mean, the guy, the guy holds like world records in the deadlift. And he says that my system is the hardest workout he's ever had. And I was like, oh, wow, dude, really? I don't yeah. know if that's helping me out. Yeah. So sales went through the roof after he said that. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of people see a bar and bands and they're like, oh, that's weak. You know, I, I'm stronger than that. But then Dr. Baker's telling him, oh, no, my deadlift on X3 is 750 pounds. Yeah. And they're like, that thing holds 750 pounds in it? Yeah. And I can put it in the backpack when I'm done? Yeah. You know, okay. So apparently I was confused. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So they get it because of, you know, what, what he said. And so, uh, yeah, it was certainly not the way I thought I should ever describe it. But now I describe it like that. Yeah. It is the hardest workout you'll ever do. It allows you to train much further than weights can. Yeah. Because you're just going to a deeper level of fatigue, like, like the diminishing range. So like when I'm doing a chest press movement like this, 
this is my first repetition. I'm holding 550 pounds. So it's 550 pounds here, about 300 here, about 100 here. So I'm going through this range of motion and it's super taxing at the top. As soon as I can't get here, well, now I'm doing shorter repetitions mm. until I can't do that anymore. And then my last couple of repetitions are just right here in the bottom. Yeah. So it fully exhausts every muscle fiber you have, which is something you can never, ever do with a weight. Yeah. And I, I certainly noticed that and, and pushing yourself to that extent, uh, you get a, you get a very, very deep, deep burn. And, uh, it's hard though, you know, because you, you have to have some like mental fortitude to be, because it hurts, you know, mm -hmm. so you're going and you're doing this and you, and you get to the point and, that a lot of people do. And they're like, Oh, well, that, that's starting to hurt. And like, Oh, I think it's, that's good enough. And, right. and the, you know, the, the good enough guys, and then like, no, 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 I'm going to go until, you know, I'm, I'm bleeding out of my eyes, guys. You know, those are, that's the, really the difference. And, and so I've noticed that uh, with this, I'm, I'm able to do that. And I think it's, is good. You know, I, I used it infrequently before just because, you know, I wasn't in the habit of using it. And I just said, you know, right, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to do it just 30 days, every single day. I'm just going to do it, you know, uh, come what may. And and I started, you know, videoing this and, and putting it up and I um, haven't been as consistent putting them up, but I, I'm still videoing them. So they're, they'll, they'll be out, but it, it was, it was actually really good that I did that because it, it made me like, not, not, uh, you know, be a little bitch. And, yeah, like, stop you're accountable. and so we're, like, we're all waiting for the update. Yeah. That was it. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, going, I'm doing this thing. I'm like, whatever. I'm like, oh, it's really like, that's killing me. And I'm like, oh, I'm on camera. And you see me sometimes look at the camera. I'm like, shit, that's there. Like, all right. I just like, keep going. I noticed that like when I do that and I really go to the point where I'm just kind of just eking out just like, you know, like half an inch sort of things at the end, it, it is, it is absolutely, you know, you know, a uh, great workout. I've, I really noticed that. And so, um, you know, one question I did have though, uh, obviously, you know, you, you feel burnt out on the one set, but you know, you, is, is there an advantage to like maybe later in the day coming back or like giving a rest and like trying to do further sets or, or is that no. not really advantageous? No, you really want to stimulate and then let protein synthesis happen. It's like, okay. you know, like, uh, you got a lot of sun in Australia. How many sets do you need to do in the sunlight to get a tan? Yeah. One. Hopefully one. Yeah. Go out once and then that's it. Yeah. And in fact, if you go out multiple times, you get blisters. And yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. You need, you need right. to heal first before you go out and give it another crack. Right. And the same thing happens to muscle. Like okay. you've seen micro tears in muscle and falsely, we thought that that had something to do with growth. Muscle damage is inversely related to growth. So mm -hmm. you want the muscle to be fatigued, but not damaged. Interesting. Okay. And it is the multiple sets and also the loading in the weaker range of motion that causes that damage. Mm -hmm. No, and also they noticed that marathon runners had more damaged quadriceps than people who would compete at the squat. And they're like, well, then how come they're not bigger? Well, because damage has nothing to do with growth. Inversely related. The more damage you have, the less you grow. Okay. So you tax it <clears throat> to the maximum extent and then mm -hmm. leave it alone. 24 yeah. hours? Food, like all out one set with the diminishing range and the constant tension. And then when you're done, just you're done. You, you got 48 hours before you hit that, that body part again. And protein synthesis is usually concluded within 36 hours. Okay. okay. You just want to make sure that all the growth happens and then you stimulate again. So is that, so would you, would you recommend taking that 36 hour break or oh so so yeah so you want to you want to yeah gap so like 48 hours so you like yeah waiting 48 hours fits a lot better on a calendar than waiting yeah. 36 hours because you don't yeah. want to have to get up in the middle of the night to do like yeah, your, nah. your chest presses yeah. uh yeah so don't don't try and time it for 36 yeah. also 36 was the average so some people right. maybe a little longer some people maybe a little shorter so you know wait 48 hours and then you can have three growth periods per week yeah because you gotta think about it you stimulate and then you're gonna grow more than you will from regular weightlifting day but you get three of those growth periods every week because you're splitting the body two ways and you have six workouts yeah yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Um, yeah. I'm certainly interested. You know, I, I, I tried taking like my weights before and I really should have done, you know, like, you know, measured, you know, chest and everything like that, but more, mostly I, I think it's just how I feel. And uh, you know, my, my repetitions are like steadily going up. Um, you know, even, you know, on alternate days, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better. I'm feeling better. I've also noticed that, um, you know, something that I, I, I've seen you talk about before, obviously there's no sort of ab component to it, but you know, the ab, uh, you know, cores are, are stabilization muscles. This, you need those stabilization muscles. Uh, you get your core. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like, so, you know, I've definitely noticed that as well, that like, it's, um, it's something that, um, uh, you really have to have a lot of control and, and so, you know, that, that comes a lot of the, the stabilization muscles in your core and, and, and elsewhere that force you to, to keep this under control because it's, it's trying to, it's trying to move on you and, you know, and so you have, you have to be able to control mm -hmm. the weight and the tension in, in weird angles that your, your body's not necessarily used to. And you have to, and you have to learn that and incorporate that. Should be, but yeah, yeah. yeah it's for yeah. some people. Well, I think um, also the last 20 years have given us a lot of machine training, yeah. which means we lack the stabilization firing to keep like a weight balanced over our heads. Yeah. You know, like we need to build that back. Yeah. Yeah. People who are like, well, this never happens on my machine presses. Yeah. Also, those are like trying to get a tan with candles. Like you're not doing it. <laughs> like, it it's not giving you what you think it's giving you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um and you have uh I have a short bar, just a normal bar as well. Is that is there an ad that's the better an, one. An, sorry? That's the better one. This is the better short, one. the short one's better. Well, it's the standard. Like it's not well, here it is. Yeah. You know, it's 20 inches wide. Mm -hmm. uh, um the wider, so people like the wider bar because they do a wide grip, like chest press, but that's like the people who do a sumo squat. They're basically just cheating while screwing up their hip joint. Uh, sumo squat really screws up your hip joint. I think uh, hip joint surgeries in the United Kingdom are up 700% Jesus. because of what they call the CrossFit squat, which is really just a sumo squat. Yeah. Same sumo deadlift, same Mm. Um, yeah, so a wide grip, you have a shorter distance, you know, if I grab out here, I'm, I only have to go, you know, maybe a foot off my chest to complete the repetition, which seems like it's easier, but it's so incorrect for joints. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, hey, if you're in a competition and the competition allows things that are damaging to the body so that you can break the record or whatever, which makes me sort of question some of the rules in powerlifting. Mm. Uh, but it allows for that. So, um, you know, that's, that's that sport. So, okay, that doesn't mean it's what we should be doing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the people who want to take a wide grip, I say, you know, the wide grip's for your ego. <laughs> it is not, it is not gonna, it's, it's gonna stimulate less growth. Okay. You know, now so many people wanted a long bar and Hey, there, there were, there were guys in, there's a lot of guys in the NBA that use X3 mm. and they were just screaming for the long bar. Mm. I kind of get it with them. Uh, what's a wide grip to me would not be a wide grip for, um, Andre Drummond who plays for the Pistons, who is almost seven feet tall. Yeah. Wow. Oh, you know, it's huge. Like, so, yeah, and it's like that bar I just showed you looks really tiny on him. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, but but he doesn't even grab out to the ends of the of that bar. He kind of grabs it, you know, more like in the middle. Yeah. So is, it, is, there, is there a proper hand placement? So when, when, I'm, when I'm doing these things, I find that my hands are actually inside my shoulders. Um, is that okay? Or do you want it like a little wider out? as well like that's what i was thinking you know like for the chest press I, i'm always grabbing on the you know kind of on the outside of the knurling mm -hmm. like right here which is about matches my my shoulders okay that's the most efficient place okay also remember i mean to get the most involvement in, in the pectoral like you want the humerus bone to come as close to the midline as possible 
Yeah. Well, if you're out here, that's the opposite of that. You have less pectoral involved. So a wide grip chest press is pretty much all tricep anyway. Yeah. Um, so the closer your hands come together, the more squeeze you're actually getting into the pectorals. You're activating more of the pectorals. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then for the bar, like I, I'll <laughs> never be photographed using the long bar. People are like, oh, well, show us how to use it. And I'm like, you make a video. Yeah. <laughs> because it was one of those things where like people wanted it so bad and i told mm. them no you don't want this <laughs> and they insisted like no no we do you want to listen to your customers but you also want them to succeed yeah. and so it's like a balance so I, I came out with a long bar and there's some giant people who love it there are some ego lifters who love it and you know i'll just have to pray for them later <laughs> uh, um, but then there's other people who are like god damn it you were right this thing is just not as good as the original it's great and of course you can get the longer bar and still grab it in the middle it's right not like not allowed to do that so uh you know but, but people were like yeah i got it and like you were right the original was better okay yeah very yeah, cool all right <clears throat> so when people are starting out with it with the XP3 bar or they're, they're trying this out, what are some, you know, are there any sort of beginner tips or thing or pitfalls or anything like that that people generally run in, run up against that uh, can be helpful to sort of. Uh, yeah. I tell people, watch the videos. We send you a yeah, link. Okay. <laughs> watch the instructional videos. It's a very simple and elegant product, but don't just pull it out of the box and see what you can figure out on your own. Typical men, uh, I can imagine. Uh, to men. read the instructions, yeah. <laughs> Who would do that? I would oh never do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, unfortunately, it's true. Of just so you got to actually watch the videos. Yeah, you got to watch. Uh, yeah, and you know, the, to get the best out of it, there's some people who just pull it out of the box and look at the. There's like a card that shows you the pictures of like, you know, the up and down position of a squat and stuff like that, and they'll try and figure it out from there, and they'll you know, maybe get 85% proficient, but they'll miss some stuff okay. that's mentioned in the video. So I tell people like, really watch those videos. Like, and you don't need to watch them all the time because you commit mm. them to memory. It's uh, like probably collectively like 20 minutes of video for like the whole thing. Like everything you need to know about your exercise will be given you in 20 minutes. So take the 20 minutes. No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah i like it um all right anthony have you got any more questions or or do you want to um i think that's uh yeah no, i think that's uh, that's covered all, all of it yeah anthony yeah. thanks for getting up this early in the morning yeah, yeah no, worries, that though. is good yeah. of anthony at 6 a.m in Perth. <laughs> yeah. he, he does it regularly i think our last one either it was super late in my day or super early in my day i don't remember which i think it was the other way around yeah i think i think maybe yeah maybe it was it sort of yeah, it was a little later for you yeah. in the day, but it was like way late for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, hey, Australia and the United States do not have accommodating time. No. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we I'm glad we were able to figure it out though. Yeah. Like uh yeah, I don't, I don't mind getting up a bit early and that's not it's not a big deal. I'm up uh stupid early normally anyway. So that's uh it's it's good for me because I, I you know get this done before I, I go into work and um Sure. and uh and then i'm uh, i'm able you know not the, the other side of it is like especially with like west coast time it's like it's like midnight before you know anybody's uh really uh, able to to hop on um you know for me because like you know midnight is like 9 a.m on the west coast so midnight for me and 9 a.m on the mm. on the west coast so it's uh probably a bit easier for me to get up a bit earlier uh so john yeah. john where are you based in the states in California. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's a place where we, it's beautiful, but we pay too much in taxes for, uh, from what know, I've heard, yeah. My God, yeah. This is a small part. You know, we have a it's very expensive place to live. Yeah, and unfortunately, California voters don't seem to be getting any smarter because they no. seem to be voting for the same people who yeah. are ruining the state, and then they complain that the state is being ruined. Mm. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's a bit confusing, you know, that, you know, that they, um, uh, you know, you, you, you vote for policies that 
that don't really help. And then you complain about the effects of that policy, and then you keep voting for that policy. The same people who are writing stupid legislation, right? Or, or, then go, yeah. or then go to other states, you know, that don't have those oh, yeah. problems. Californians move to other states yeah. and then screw those other states up by voting <laughs> get to ruin their state. And then they're like, oh, what happened? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard there's a bit of animosity in in Austin and Miami about all the Californians moving in. I was like plague rats just going around all over the all over the place, just like bringing disease everywhere they go. Yeah, and I'm from California. I grew up in Cal in Southern California. Like that is that is my home state, and I absolutely love it there. But it's um, you know, and unfortunately, uh, it's getting more difficult to live there. Um, you know, for a number of reasons, and hopefully that. That turns around because obviously you know uh, California is a lovely place, and um, and then people are just trying to be people and live their lives, but it's uh, it's getting much more difficult uh, at the moment. So hopefully that that turns around anyway. Um, but John, thank you so much uh, for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time, um, and this is really great. Hopefully we can do it again uh, as well and talk more uh, shop about, uh, uh, exercise physi physiology and, and, uh, and how to get people actually fit and healthy, you know, because that's all, all part of the whole paradigm, you know, like eating right, exercising, moving your body and just being healthy and being able to stay strong, stay healthy mentally and physically for the longest, longest possible period as well. So I appreciate you, uh, taking the time with us. Mm. Thanks guys. Absolutely. Right. Thank you so much, John. All right. All right. Have a good day. Thanks. Right. See you guys. Thank you.